Religion and Society. This topic covers at least five key areas. Gender and feminism in Islam, pluralism, non-Muslims in Muslim societies, Muslims in non-Muslim societies, and issues facing a multi-faith society. So let's start by looking at the role of gender and feminism in Islam. And it's worth noting that there is a whole anthology text by Leila Ahmed in the final chapter of her book called Conclusion, where she addresses ideas about women, gender, feminism in Islam. And there are separate videos with her biography and a walkthrough of that text in another place. So you can click on the link and go there. Islam is a way of life. Gender in scripture and early Islam shows us that from the outset, society started with the creation of man and woman. In the Quran chapter 4, verse 1, it says, People be mindful of your Lord who created you from a single soul, and from it created its mate. And from the pair of them spread countless men and women far and wide. So we also learn not just that there was a man and a woman created, but also in chapter 20, verse 50, that men and women are given a form. In other words, there's a clear distinctive difference between the shape and nature of their bodies. And they've been given roles and responsibilities. This is to achieve God's plan and purpose. There are distinct elements with their roles and responsibilities. And the purpose of that distinction is to achieve peace in the home and in society. So having a clear understanding of the roles and responsibilities of men and women in Islam brings peace. In a hadith, Muhammad taught that harmony in the world is not possible without harmony in the home. In Sunan al-Tamidi, it says, the best of you is the one who behaves best towards your women. But it's not just the, the physical element that distinguishes men and women. And it's not just the equality that the Quran preaches in the home, there's also a spiritual equality to emphasize here. The Quran emphasizes that men and women are spiritually equal before Allah. Both of them stand before him on judgment day and are rewarded for their righteous deeds. In chapter 3, verse 195. In chapter 33, verse 35, there are 10 levels of faith. And you can see things like dressing modestly, which we'll talk about later, fasting, giving to charity. And these things can be achieved by both men and women. So it's demonstrating the equality. Let's have a look at, briefly, some women in early Islam. And I think this helps us demystify some of the misconceptions that are out there. Women have played a central role in Islam in the spread of the Ummah. There are many examples. You can look at the wives of the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, they're known in chapter 33, verse 6, as the mothers of the believers. You have Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet, who supported him financially and emotionally. We know she was a very wealthy widow, much older than the Prophet. We have Aisha, one of the most common narrators of the Hadith and known to be an early scholar. Muhammad said that Muslims could learn half the faith from her alone. And there's Hafsa, who helped preserve the Quran and keep safe its compilation used by Caliph Uthman. You've got his daughter, Fatima. Shias believe her to be one of the 14 infallible 
immune from sin and mistakes, along with her father and the twelve imams. There's a woman called Samaya, and she's believed to be one of the first believers and martyrs in Islam. There's Kaula, who's a female warrior found in early battles, and we also see many schools, streets, and military units in some Islamic countries named after her. There's Um al Dada, a 7th century scholar who taught law in the mosques of Damascus and Jerusalem with male and female students. There's Fatima al Fahiri, the founder of the world's oldest degree granting university. This is the university and mosque of al Karawin in Morocco in, 18, in 859. So, some very great key players who are women in early Islam. There are traditional views of gender and there are many cultural norms in Muslim majority countries which have shaped the understanding and practice of Islam and it makes it very difficult to distinguish between Islamic teachings and culture. So the Quran advocates gender equality, but it is challenging to implement in societies under the strong influence of cultural norms like forced marriages or denying girls education. You've got diversity with the hijab. Some wear the face veil, the niqab and the cloak, the chador, outside of the home, and some don't cover their heads at all. So Afghanistan and Iran typically are seen as countries that expect women to wear this outside of the home. There's female genital mutilation, FGM, which is associated with Islam in places like parts of Africa, Yemen, and some other countries. The thing is, this is a cultural practice long before Islam was practiced, and many non-Muslims practice it too. And I suppose what we want to say here is that there is a cultural element that has been conflated with the teachings of Islam. And so it's in some countries, it's very difficult to um, distinguish the blur between traditional views of culture and of Islam. Many marry Muslim men, but in 2017 in Tunisia, they allowed Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men under a secular rather than a Sharia law. And that's because some Muslim states have separated religion from state as well. And so typically we see more men attend universities and graduate. And there's one exception, which is Algeria, where we have more women attending and graduating from university. So there are some very traditional cultural norms, but we have to be clear that this doesn't mean it's necessarily Islam. But many Muslims may be practicing cultural norms. Family life. So marriage is where the two genders work best together. Male and female get married and it's sacred in Islam. It's the cornerstone of society. There's an expectation that you have children and you usually see larger families within Muslim communities. Children are considered to be a blessing from God and parents are given importance. So mothers in particular, due to the suffering during their pregnancy, in chapter 46, verse 15, mothers have a high status in the Quran. Paradise lies at the feet of your mothers. And that's found in Hadith Sunan al Nasa. So we also see here um, that the Ummah is considered to be a family for all Muslims. And that refers, where Muslims refer to each other as brother and sister. But it's worth looking at the roles of men and women in the Quran. So a man in the Quran is seen to be a breadwinner, someone who pays the bills, upkeeps the house. The role of a woman is to be a wife and a mother. For the man, he's to treat his wife with kindness. For the woman, she's to be faithful and obedient to the husband. And the man is to help with the running of the household, which was modelled by the Prophet Muhammad. 
and women are to run the home and they'll often be the ones to educate the children in Islam and in matters of morality. So there's very clear traditional roles there. But there are changing roles in society. So some Muslims have changed attitudes. And this has led to better access to education, to career opportunities, to social interactions where young women are less reliant on families to find them a husband. Some women that have careers don't even see a need for a husband to be the one to provide for them. Men can sometimes then feel less pressured to be the breadwinner and can get involved in other aspects of family life. The rise of feminine, feminism in the Muslim world and the West has influenced Muslim ideas about the role of women. So there are many feminist scholars which challenge the patriarchal forces which deny women equality around the world. And they also seek to restore the rights of women which are found in the Quran. And the Prophet Muhammad himself promoted these rights 14 centuries ago. We're not going to go into Layla Ahmed's work here, but she is a famous feminist scholar, an Egyptian American from Harvard University, who wrote a book, Women and Gender in Islam. You can go and click on the other videos and learn about that for this topic. She argued against the oppressive practices that women are subjugated to in the Middle East, and she suggests that Islam has evolved. There is a controversial verse in the Quran that gets interpreted in different ways. Chapter 4, verse 34. In Surah Al-Nisa, it says, Men are the caretakers of women, as men have been provisioned by Allah over women and tasked with supporting them financially. And righteous women are devoutly obedient and, when alone, protective of what Allah has entrusted them with. And if you sense ill conduct from your women, advise them first. If they persist, do not share their beds, but if they still persist, then discipline them gently. But if they change their ways, do not be unjust to them. Surely Allah is most high or great. Some have interpreted this to mean that men are permitted to beat women and justify violence. But many women believe that the original Arabic offers more context than that simple interpretation. The word nushuz high-handedness, disloyalty, ill conduct, is for a person meaning that any evil, including violence, on the part of the violence. And so it could be, therefore, the man's right to defend himself against his wife's physical aggression. So some see it as actually a reaction to a man being physically attacked. It could be the man's right to defend himself. But other people point out that violence is always a last resort and the husband has to be patient first. We can see in the verse, advise them first, withdraw from um, having sex with them, and if they still persist, then discipline them gently. It's the discipline them gently that is up for debate. Allah is considered to be always above everyone, and so men are responsible for their actions. There's a hadith Kathir, that refers to Muhammad condemning women who beat their wives. So most scholars would take this to say that it doesn't justify violence. The hijab is a partition, a barrier, and a screen. It's often used for modest dress, typically a headscarf, but for some it's also a face veil. And alongside the hijab of the body, there's also the hijab of the eyes, the heart, the thought, the niya, the intention. And so the conduct of a person is their modesty. So when you're writing about the hijab, take it deeper. Talk about its symbolic spiritual representation. Some, however, will see it as a symbol of inequality. Outdated, a form of discrimination that needs challenging. And for others, it's a symbol of faith, empowerment, worn with pride, and it's used against sexual harassment. So is there gender equality in Islam? Well, for gender equality and against gender equality, you've got some of these 
following arguments. For gender equality, the Quran promises an equal reward for men and women for their faith, summarized from earlier. But against gender equality, men can marry non-Muslims, but women can't do it. So a man could marry a Jew or a Christian, but a woman can't, um, a, a female Muslim can't do the same. Prophet Muhammad advocated for women's rights in a patriarchal society. If you go back to your notes on the Jahaliya and what the Quraysh did and how they treated women, Muhammad preached against that. He rejected female infant side, bearing baby daughters alive, and said that girls should be educated. However, the husband is solely responsible for the family home and must share earnings with his wife. But interestingly here, the wife doesn't have to share her earnings with the husband. So you could say that the husband has less rights there than the woman. Islam gave rights to women centuries before other cultures in the West, and that's a very important point to note. And if you think about your study of Islam and science, you should know that the golden age of Islam um, came before Western enlightenment in Europe. And so there was a lot more progression in Islamic communities before Europe became the dominant force. But there are more religious demands on men than women. Men can't be exempt from prayer and fasting uh, on the most part, but women who are menstruating or pregnant can. This is probably a weaker argument because it's suggesting that, that there's no gender equality because a man can't be excused from prayer and fasting because he can't menstruate or get pregnant, uh, which is a, pretty much a given. So, pluralism. Freedom of thought and belief for all. So this section of the topic is about living in a global society amongst lots of other faiths, religions, cultures, beliefs. Muhammad's aim was to restore Tawheed as he warned people against idolatry. In Surah chapter 2, the Quran says there is no compulsion in religion. Now, there are some groups like Jamaat-e Islami who argue that if someone converts to Islam by their free will, they must remain believers. And this is the basis for apostasy laws, which we'll come to in a moment. But others argue that it's inconsistent with teachings that permit people to leave and join Islam. That in the Quran, they argue there's a lot more flexibility here for changing your mind. And Muslims are to have respect and regard for the beliefs of others. So Islam promotes respect for all faiths. The Prophet told off a Muslim in Hadith Bukhari for offending a Jew. This picture here is of the golden calf found in the Bible um, where the Israelites at one point were worshipping an idol. The Quran teaches Muslims not to revile the gods of idolatrous. In other words, not to mock them, tease them, um, slander them in public. And there should be protection of the rights of all believers. So the Quran in chapter 22 upholds the rights of other religions and instructs Muslims to protect their places of worship. Muhammad himself signed what was called the Charter of Privileges. And this is a promise to Christians on behalf of Muslims to safeguard their churches until the final days. And when returning to Mecca, Muhammad ordered hundreds of idols to be cleared from the Kaaba. Some people interpret that to give them permission to do the same. And so this is a picture of the Buddha statue in Afghanistan where the Taliban in 2001 used this idea of the Kaaba and the hundreds of idols being destroyed to destroy two Buddha statues in Afghanistan. However, other people would say that the Prophet's actions were very specific to that time. And in fact, you could say that the idols were in a holy Muslim place that was being reclaimed. Conversion. 
Islam is a proselytizing faith. That means it seeks to spread. And there is something called dawah, and that is to invite other people to the right path with wisdom and good teaching, to argue with them in the most courteous manner. Chapter 16 of the Quran instructs Muslims to be polite and courteous when they try and persuade people to join Islam. Muhammad did it by writing letters to heads of state, inviting them in surrounding areas to come to Islam. There is a minority of Muslims that do see the world in quite a binary way as divided as Dar al-Islam, the abode of Islam, the house of Islam, and that's when you're living in a Muslim state, and Dar al ab the abode of war, the house of war, and that's when you're living in a non-Muslim state. And we're going to look at those two things. The aim is to convert as many people as possible to expand the house of Islam and to re-establish a caliphate. Now you can see that taken hold by many extremists when you look at ISIS um, and other groups, but it's also a completely mainstream Islamic concept as well to spread the message of Islam and see as many people join the faith. But what's key to this is that forced conversions are forbidden. Remember, there's no compulsion in religion. Now, some Muslim men who marry Christian and Jewish women don't require them to convert. But there are others who refer to conversion as well as reversion. And they have this view that you're being restored to your natural born state of being a Muslim. Justice and liberation play a role and mercy too in the heart of Islam to deal with social inequalities, and we see this during the Jahiliya. The Quran and the Sunnah speak of helping the poor, having a communal responsibility for Muslims. In fact, it's a duty. This links to zakah, one of the five pillars. It links to greater jihad and lesser jihad, as it's about dealing with social injustice. Now, some believe that liberation has implications. So this freedom can have implications for controlling social order in order to preserve the rights of all members of society. There can be a tension here in allowing too much freedom that you then lose some of the law. But there are different approaches to social freedom and liberation in Islam. Now, some take very practical action to resist oppression. There's someone called Ali Shariati, who we're going to look at. And others believe that individual purification will bring a wider change, such as Abdul Hakim Murad. Well, let's have a look at them. The first is Ali Shariati. He argued that all the prophets stood up to free the oppressed. He believed that Muhammad's companions, like Abu Dhar, denounced Sunni caliphs as corrupt, including Yazid, who Imam Hussein refused to pay allegiance to. His views were influenced by a Marxist ideology. And the inspiration for the Iranian revolution in 1979, he was inspired, advocating social revolution to end all exploitation, poverty, capitalism, to modernize the economy and remove a classless society, to bring justice. It's a very Marxist idea. He was very critical of apolitical Shiism. Shiism should affect all areas, he believed, of politics. So as a Shiite, he believed that politics and religion were one. Abdul Hakim Murad is a traditional Sufi. And he talks about having activism from within. So this is where you might look at the more greater jihad notion. He was critical of Islamist revivalism because he says it blames the West rather than focusing on your individual spiritual renewal like the early Muslims did. He says it's important, like the Quran says, to pursue a sound heart first. This is how you're going to tackle justice and liberation. Many Muslims today engage in promoting social justice through peaceful campaigning. Now, this is quite useful as a link 
to the topic of jihad. Let's look at non-Muslims in Muslim societies. If you are a non-Muslim in a Muslim society, you are called a dhimmi. Dhimmis are non-Muslims under Islamic rule. They have their rights and protections given to them. They can practice their religion, but they have to pay a tax, a jizya. Now in Arabia, originally it was only people of the book. So typically Jews and Christians, monotheists. And the aim of that was to preserve the concept of Tawhid, to ensure that polytheism and idolatry didn't take hold. And that's a reaction to the Jahiliya. Caliph Umar exempted people who served in the military. So if you are of different religion and you served in the military for that Muslim state, you didn't have to pay the tax. Also, women, children, the elderly, disabled, and religious leaders of other faiths are exempt from paying the tax. And interestingly, the welfare state of the Muslim state supported Jews and Christians back then from the treasury. And if dhimmis were not protected, if the state didn't do its job and protect them, they paid back to those people the jizya, the tax. Now, when the Islamic empire expanded, dhimmi status also expanded, and it served Zoroastrians, even Indian Hindus and Buddhists. But then under the Umayyads, under that dynasty, dhimmis were tolerated less, and the tax sometimes was increased here or there. Today, it's not collected in modern Muslim states. So Turkey, Algeria and Egypt, for example, have separated religion from the state. Also, there is the issue of apostasy, and this is renouncing your religion. Muhammad said that anyone who is a deserter of Islam in Hadith Muslim, if they abandon the Muslim community, should be killed. So this is why in 13 Muslim countries, apostasy carries the death penalty. Now, some people argue that the Quran doesn't allow this, but it guarantees freedom of belief for those who change their minds. It's okay for people to change their minds about their faith. The Quran many argue, comes before the Hadith. It supersedes it on this matter. So there are varying views about apostasy laws. We can look at history when Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. They lived in peace with Jews and Christians. In fact, it was said that Jews and Christians often had more freedoms in Spain at the time than in other parts of Europe where they sometimes were persecuted. But under the Ottoman Empire, non-Muslims were not equal to Muslims. They were known as infidels. So there's a mixed history about how apostasy is approached. During the Abbasids, for example, if you refused to pay your tax, it could lead to your death. Today, it's worth noting that Christians can still experience persecution in the Middle East, in North Africa, and particularly in Pakistan today. Well, let's turn to look at Muslims in non-Muslim societies. This is because of migration. So the first large groups of Muslims arrived in Britain in the early 18th century. Sailors employed by the East India Company were brought over and they were based in the port towns of England. In 1950, Britain encouraged migrants from the Commonwealth nations after World War II to come to the UK. And this led many coming from India and Pakistan, and therefore they were Muslim. This is what led to what we call today a multicultural Britain. The conflict in Syria has led to mass migration. People come into Europe looking for safety. So can Muslims integrate in a secular European society? On the one hand, yes. Many keep their Islamic identity, they've got a successful career, but others fear of losing their identity if they get too involved in society because it could compromise their faith. There are 26 MPs in the House of Commons in the UK, most of them are women. But there are some jobs in conflict with Islam, like selling alcohol or jobs that involve gambling. 
We see inclusion of Muslims in the UK with many mosques that have been built, with halal food, with teaching Islam in RE. But there is also a fear of being attacked and persecuted, even in the UK. You could, for example, for wearing a headscarf. We look at the constitution of Medina as a model for inclusivism today. What happened back then, Muslims can see happen today. But there's not always the option to educate your children because you may not have faith schools available. The Quran teaches equality, just like the West talks about equality. But some Islamic law can make it difficult, like in finance, to buy a house without a mortgage because of interest laws, like riba. And student loans for university can be a problem for young people. Schools and work, however, allow Muslims to observe religious worship and festivals. It becomes protected as religious observance. But having inclusive access to halal food and faith schools could lead to more separation in society. Muslims are a religious minority. Many Muslims have migrated due to war or discrimination. There's only, I think, over 2 million or so Muslims in the UK. Sharia law, however, can be practiced in the UK by a minority, um, only usually when it comes to community issues. So it can't supersede UK law, but you can have small Sharia family courts in the UK. You might see the Prime Minister, you might see the Royal Family highlight different celebrations of faiths and religion. So Ramadan, Eid, Muslims get wished well, and that shows inclusivity. There's also the prevent strategy, which is a strategy that was brought in as a reaction to terrorism to prevent people from extremist vulnerabilities getting involved in acts of violence. Now, this didn't go down too well in the beginning. It was very covert and many Muslims felt marginalized. They felt targeted and were, in fact, monitored. However, today it's covert, uh, it's overt, which means that it's uh, based on dialogue, it's based on an open strategy to talk to um, people. Now, it's not just targeted at Muslims, it's also for the far right um, and for any extremism that could be found that threatens um, national security. But uh, it's worth pointing out that this has only been partly successful at times. Um, and there are many other times where it has led to Muslims just feeling marginalised in society. So, finally, what issues are facing a multi-faith society? Well, there are Western perceptions. You can write about uh, how the media portray um, Muslims. So you can talk about political views um, that exist. Uh, there could be agendas. Um, politically against uh, some communities, um, but also as a reaction to that, you're seeing many, many Muslims getting politically active. And so, as I said earlier, there's 26 or so MPs who are Muslim in the UK alone. You've got a current London mayor called Sadiq Khan, who is a prominent Muslim. Um, and so there are many influential positions in government. There's the media representation. So you see um, Muslims in a multi-faith society being represented in the media. Now, some of this is good, some of this is bad. So you'll often see headlines like Muslim gang slashes tire of immigration raid van, and there's no evidence really that backs it up. Um, and it gives um, the community a bad name. So people worried about the Islamification of Britain, that can get portrayed in the media. You could, for example, look at things like Boris Johnson's journalist article years ago where he talked about um, Muslim women as letterboxes, which was an offensive term used. You've got uh, newspapers, which is what I've just been speaking about. You've got television um, discussing Islam. So BBC, The Big Questions. You've got um, lots of discussions about some of the things we've talked about. Um, like the hijab, like um, apostasy and the death penalty in countries and things like that. And as a consequence of this, many Muslims have tried to break into the media 
and the, and, and the TV industry. There's also Islamophobia facing Muslims today. And this is usually, you would find this perhaps in more rural parts of the UK where there's not as many Muslims. Um, and then when a family might choose to live there or move there, then you're going to have a lot of prejudice and discrimination for people that fear difference. And that can also cause Muslims to be vulnerable to extremism because they can then get angry about how they're being treated and then they see the West as the enemy. There's the Muslim Council of Britain, which was set up in 1997. It's an independent, uh, non-sectarian umbrella for Muslims. And this is a way of helping protect Muslims, to create unity, to help them integrate into Britain, and it often speaks on behalf of British Muslims. There's also finally interfaith work, and this is to encourage diversity, to encourage belief and faith, and this is about respect for other faiths. So this is bringing together a forum of, of religious leaders, so imams talking to rabbis, talking to priests, talking to um, monks, there's people of all different faiths that come together to work together to discuss how they can bring their communities peacefully in harmony together um, despite their differences.